everybody. On behalf of the Highland Park Public Library, we'd like to welcome you to Library in Your Living Room. We are pleased to present Shelf Isolation, a weekly mini-series about books, culture, and what to read next. I'm Sarah, and this is your Information and Reader Services Department. In this episode, we are excited to share with you what we've been reading, watching, and are listening to during self-isolation. To begin our mini-series, I'm going to turn things over to Reader's Roundtable expert and moderator, Michelle. Thanks, Sarah. If you all remember last week, I read a book by Jane Harper called The Last Man. So this week, I read another book by Jane Harper. This was called The Force of Nature. This is the second book in the Aaron Fox series after The Dry, which of course you know I loved. So this one is about five women go on a hike through the Gerling Ranges as kind of a company retreat. And when they return, only four of them are they where and they are injured and each of them have a different story about what happened. The woman that disappeared, her name is Alice Russell. She has, her being missing is a great interest to federal police investigator Aaron Falk. She was a whistleblower in a case in which he's investigating a company and their finances. It was really spooky. It kind of flashes back to the women's hike they're wondering what happened to her. It turns out that many years ago, this area was where a serial killer murdered women. And uh, even though he's in jail, his son might be around. So was it the serial killer? Was it one of the women? Who knows what happened to Alice? Is she alive? Is she dead? Um, this is a really great book. I really like Aaron Falk. I like that he's not a really a police investigator. He is a financial investigator, but he just keeps getting sucked into these cases. He has a wonderful partner, but I really liked their relationship. They have a really great friendship. And this was just a really great book. I just really like Jane Harper a lot. So if you really haven't read any of her books, I really do highly recommend them. They're all just wonderful. And of course, you know, they take place in Australia and it's just really great. She's just a really great of making Australia another character. She's just a really great writer. And that's actually all I have to talk about today. So I'm gonna pass it on to Stephanie. Thank you, Michelle. I kind of did the same thing that you did. I actually, you know, I love Agatha Christie. I, of course, love mysteries because that's all I seem to talk about. The 100th year of Agatha Christie's first novel came out. I read another Sophie Hannah book, and it's called The Killing at Kingfisher Hill. She's one of three authors that the Christie estate has authorized to carry on the characters in the Agatha Christie series. So she is writing about Hercule Perrault, and then his sidekick, which is Catchpool, who is Detective Inspector from Scotland Yards. And the story, it's pretty interesting. It starts out that they're waiting to catch a bus that's gonna take them to Kingfisher Hill Estates. And while they're waiting, of course, it has the usual Agatha Christie type, the characters and things. And there's this one woman that everyone keeps like going, what is wrong with her? Catchpool labels her as the woman with half a face. And it's because she's like standing, I guess, like she's in shock. So she has this horror look on her face, like, you know, just frozen is how you kind of, you can envision it the way she describes it. So he walks up to her and he asks her, you know, can I help you? And she's even more terrified, like, you know, get away. No, 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 you know, on and on. Hercule Perros, what happened? And he's like, I don't know. She doesn't want to talk to me. So they get on this bus and this man who he's going on and on about this is the best coach you'll ever be on, you know, the smoothest ride on and on. And all the seats are taken, we're always sold out. And so they get on the bus and they're waiting. There's one more person that they're waiting for and they can see the bus drivers like, are you gonna get on or are you not gonna? So this lady gets on and there's only one seat left. So she sits down and of course then you can envision cause she like freaks out. So she's like making a seat. Hercule Perot, of course, Mr. Suave Debonair, goes in and says, is there something we can help you with, madame? And so she explains to him that some man approached her who looked a lot like Catchpool, that he told her that if she sits in seat number seven, that she will die. Well, guess what? The only seat available was seat seven, so she didn't want to sit in it, of course. So finally, she convinces somebody to trade seats. So she ends up sitting next to Catchpool, and then her clay pros and sits next to this other lady who was not nice at all. She was mean to everyone. So they've named her Diamond Face because she's just gorgeous. And so she goes on and she tells Hercule through that this story about, because she thinks, oh, I'm never going to see this guy again. So she basically confesses to murder. Well, they stop at the first stop. And so Hercule Perot has told her that he's getting off at that stop, that he's not going on. So she's told him, you know, well, I murdered this man. He was the love of my life on and on and on. So they get off. I guess I should call it a coach because they call it a coach, not a bus. And England. So they get they get off the coach, they're waiting, and then they talk to this woman again, and she like says, I live with my aunt, and she scurries off. This is 
the lady missing part of the face, which he's not really missing part of the face. But so then they come back and they get back on the bus. And of course, Diamond Face is freaked out because they're not supposed to be on the bus. So now she's worried he's going to figure out who she is. Diamond Face gets off the bus at the next stop. And then they take it on up to Kingfisher Hill and they meet this family that is just not very nice. And their whole reason why Hercule Perot and Catchpool are going here, it's they're pretending that they're interested in this game called Peepers, which is supposed to be a competitor to Monopoly. And the story set in the 1930s, they get there, but really they're trying to prove that this not another lady did not murder the brother of this family. There's lots of twists and turns. I'm going on and on. I'm telling too much of the story. So it's like all these great twists and turns, great puzzle pieces to put together like an Agatha Christie. And the ending really surprises you, but it's really neat just listening to how she puts all the characters and the different little parts. And you know, it was a really great mystery. And then the other one I have for you is the fourth book, Liar Liar by MJ for Arlen. The fourth book in the Helen Grace series. And this one is about an arsonist. And the story starts out that the town that she's in, Southampton, that there are three fires that take place. And so her and her group, they're running all over the place trying to figure out what's going on. And it ends up that within 24 hours, there are six fires. And the one thing that they discover is, is that the two of the fires that are placed are like diversion tactic to make them focus on that one. And then the real target is one of the fires. And it's a really good story. With Helen Gray, she get the action, the psychological part of it, because you have her dark side, more of it coming out, where her personal life, she does very dark things. But then her professional life, she's just this fabulous detective. Her professional life looks 100% great. And then the other side's a little bit sketchy. The nice part about the whole story is, is that they catch one person and then it kind of ties in. They think that that person has something to do with it. And they're like, really, how could this person really be doing this? And it has a really great ending to it that you don't see coming. So those are the two stories that I have. I'm going to turn it over now to Karen. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, I have some mysteries to talk about myself. First one is The Cuckoo's Calling by Robert Galbraith, which I mentioned last week. Now I know, having finished, who the culprit was. And I was surprised. I always like to guess who I think the culprit will be, and I'm usually not right, but I, I was half right this time. And I thought the author wrapped up the, the details well. You know, suddenly, all, all, of it, all at once at the end, we know everything. So main interest, as I mentioned before, was not so much the crime, but the crime solving, you know, the detective work and the deduction and how the detective, Cormoran Strike and his assistant worked together. That was the best part for me. I don't know if I'll continue with this series, but I'm sure there will be about 15 books by the time the author's finished. So there'll be a lot if I choose to go back to it. But speaking of series, I ran into the patron who recommended to me the Inspector Montalbano series by Andrea Camilleri. We talked a little bit about this you know, with our masks on and, and laughed about the funny stories and the characters. And she said, well, she happens to teach communications at a local college. And she said, I like the language aspect of these books. You know, the fact that he's in Sicily, you know, the detective is in Sicily and his girlfriend's in um, Genoa. And, you know, it's like they're in two different countries. They're really in Italy. But it turns out, I thought Sicilian was an Italian dialect, and a lot of people would say it's its own language. I looked this up a little bit today. I found a Mango Languages blog, and it says that unlike Italian, which is almost entirely Latin-based, Sicilian has elements of Greek, Arabic, French, Catalan, and Spanish. I looked into Mango Languages, which you might know as something on our database page at the library that is the language learning product. Among their 70 languages, they list Italian, but they don't have Sicilian. So I couldn't really do any kind of comparison. But I thought that was interesting, and I will pay more attention to the part that language plays in these books when I continue reading. And I'm on book seven. I'm not sure I'll start this week. But this morning, I just got the newest Anne Cleves book, which is called The Darkest Evening. And this is the latest in the, in the Vera Stanhope series. So I'm anxious to get to that as soon as I can. So that's the plan for this week. And next, we'll talk to Sarah. Thanks, Karen. So first, I have a Halloween book recommendation from my two-year-old. This is Pumpkin Jack. It's a very sweet story of a little boy who puts his pumpkin out in the yard after Halloween, and then it gets buried in the snow, and then it's spring, and the seed starts to grow, and then he has more pumpkins the next year. So, spoiler alert. <laughs> but it was really cute. And it's a great one if you're looking for a kid's Halloween book that isn't at all scary. No witches, no ghosts, just cute pumpkins. And my toddler loves pointing out all the pumpkins in our neighborhood. He says, big punk, and points to them. So anyway, so that's his recommendation. So the first book I read this week was 
Take a Hint, Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is the second in her Brown Sisters series. I talked about the first one, Get a Life, Chloe Brown, back probably April, May. But I love the series so far. In this one, Danny, the middle sister, is a PhD student and a witch, <laughs> but like she believes in Wicca and that is her religion. And she has this like flirty friendship with the security guard, Zephyr until she gets trapped in an elevator. He has to rescue her, except it's actually just a fire drill, but she doesn't know it's a drill. He rescues her, carries her out of the building. A video of him carrying her goes viral. And so they have to have a fake relationship to help promote his charity. It's very cute. I like how her books are very positive about mental health, about self-care, and have very interesting characters. I especially liked that Zephyr, the love interest in this one, reads romance novels. So very cute series. The third book about the youngest sister, Eve, comes out in March. I just saw today that I might be able to get an advanced reader copy of it, so I'm going to request that and hope to be reading that soon. But the second book I read this week was Return to Virgin River by Robin Carr. I also talked about this series months ago and was very happy to have finished the 20 book series, went on Goodreads to mark it completed, and saw that after eight years, of no books in the series, there was a new one coming out in October. So I just read it over the weekend, finished, mostly read it because I had an advanced reader copy, but ended up finishing it on audio while driving home from work yesterday. And it's very similar to all the rest of the Virgin River series. I don't need to go into a lot of details, but it was a really sweet romance, sweet family story. And I think it's the end of the series, but I thought that about the last one, so I'm not sure. But this series has gotten more popular because it is also a Netflix show now. And speaking of Netflix shows, I just wanted to mention an announcement this week from the romance world that I am very excited about. Bridgerton, the new Netflix series based on the Julia Quinn series of novels, finally has a release date. It will be out on Christmas Day. So that is what I will be watching as soon as my child goes to sleep on Christmas. If you haven't read that series and you like historical romance, it's set in the Regency period. Each book follows a different sibling in the family. And I think all of the books are available as ebook on Libby. I know at least the first one, The Duke and I, is available on Libby. I checked today. So that is a great series, one of my favorite Regency romances, and I'm very excited to see the Netflix series. I should also mention that the Netflix series is being produced by Shonda Rhimes, best known for Grey's Anatomy. So that is what I'm excited about this week, and I will pass things on to Jackie. Thank you, Sarah. So this week I finished a book called Sisters by Choice by Susan Mallory, and this is about cousins who grew up together. It's about Sophie, Christine, Amber, and Amber's daughter, Heather. So Sophie has a business of supplying cats thing. Um, it can be food, costumes, whatever you want to dress your cat in. And her business is in California and it burns down on Monday. So her warehouse is gone. All the things are gone. Her offices are gone. Everything's gone. So she decided to move back to Blackberry Island where she grew up. She also decided at one point that she was not ever getting another cat again because her cat had just passed away. And she was not really interested in having a romantic relationship with a man. She didn't mind hanging out with guys for a while, but it was just too much for her. Her cousin, Christine, who is successfully married to Jackson, and they have three boys who are 14, 12, and 10. And Christine loved her life. She loves being taking care of her boys. She loves being in the house, but she wants to open a bakery. And she has kind of a business going already where basically she takes Thursday evening and overnight Friday bake things. And she has a very thriving business this way, but she really wants to open a bakery. And there is a bakery that happens to be available for rent. So if she wants to do that, but her husband Jackson does not want her to be working outside the home. And then you have the third cousin, Amber. Amber's life is not real good. And she, everything has gone wrong. She's very dysfunctional. And she relies on her daughter, Heather, Heather, who's 20, to take care of her. And as a matter of fact, she manipulates Heather to give her money. For instance, shortly before um, the book starts, she's in a car accident. So she has picked out a car, but she doesn't really have the money to pay for this. So she manipulates Heather into giving her her savings so that she could buy this car. And Heather at 20 is working several part-time jobs 
to save money so she can get off Blackberry Island and go to college. So this story is about these four women who all have something that they really want and they just don't know how to find it. And because it's a Susan Mallory book, guess what? It all ends happy. All of these people get what they want in life. And it's quite interesting because there's some questions at the end of the book for if you're reading it for a book group. And one of the questions mentioned that Susan Mallory thought of ambition before she wrote this book. So all these women have ambition and how they can actually meet those ambitions they like to have. So it's a delightful book. And this is um, actually book four in the Blackberry Island series, but the books for other books are kind of older. So you may want to find those because once again, they were like the other book and i mentioned this book a couple months ago it's called love and other crimes and this is by sarah porowski she is the author of the bi worst Jousty series that takes place in chicago and this collection of stories uh, there are 14 stories that were written over about 20 years and published in various publications over this time period and they um are as i said in, in her introduction she said these stories are all about the theme of people who kill for love so it's kind of a very interesting thing. The stories cover historical periods from probation areas into the 60s and into the present day. Eight of the stories are V.I. Wachowski as the narrator. The interesting thing is at the end of these stories, there's a note that kind of explains what was the catalyst for her to writing the story. For instance, one of the stories is someone is accused of killing someone at work after they had been fired the week before. So he was obviously a good target for this. And she had a friend who was fired from work and she just kind of took her anger about her friend and wrote this story. So it's a very interesting collection. Um, if you enjoy short stories or mysteries, you really should you know, pick this up and read. The other thing that I've been thinking about is early voting and voting since the election is in a couple of weeks. Early voting has started. And you're going to see Catherine. Catherine has her I voted button on, which is good. The early voting site in Highland Park has moved from the police station to the Highland Park Country Club, which is on Park Avenue West. And the hours, I believe, are 8.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 to 5 Saturday and Sunday. You can also drop off your mail and ballot into, they have a drop box there for that. And it's the same hours as the early voting hours. So think about what you want to do with your voting. and. I am now going to turn this over to Catherine. Thank you, Jackie. So first I'll hold up my, my I Voted sticker. The first book I read is actually written before women had the vote. It's the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket by Edgar Allan Poe, which came out in 1838. It is Poe's only novel. It's about Arthur Gordon, Gordon Pym of Nantucket, as the title suggests. It starts out with him and his good friend Augustus getting drunk and going sailing and almost dying. And from there, they decide, this is great, we should go to sea together. So they come up with a plan to travel on the ship of which Augustus's father is the captain, so that works out very well. But Pim's mother, as you might imagine, is dead against it. She says, this is way too dangerous, she just won't stop crying over the whole idea. This is really the only woman who shows up in the entire book, and the only sensible person, really, if you ask me. Pim comes up with an idea to get around this, along with Augustus, which is basically, Augustus is going to help Pim stow away on the ship, and then once they get far enough out to sea where they can't turn back, then Pim will reveal himself, and the crew, I guess, is just going to have to suck it up and take him on. Pim is down in this storeroom, in this little box that Augustus has created for him, with some food, with some provisions, and he's stowed away for a while. But things start going kind of weirdly. Augustus after showing up once or twice kind of stops coming to him and Pim is kind of having trouble staying conscious it seems like maybe there's some bad air or something he you know sleeps for what seems like three days and things start to get really weird and I won't tell you exactly how he eventually gets out of that but he does and he finds out what's going on. And from there, it's just high seas adventure. So there's mutiny, there's murder, there's cannibalism, there's fights with sharks, there's pretending to be a ghost Scooby-Doo style. And <laughs> eventually, when things have gone from bad to worse, every time it seems like they possibly can, eventually we get into the later part of the book where Pim and a crew member named Dirk Peters, who has been sympathetic, wind up on another ship. 
and the captain of that ship wants to try to sail to the South Pole. So they're sort of exploring around the Antarctic region. As they near the Antarctic, they discover this tropical island, which seems improbable, but you know, this is how the book goes, and they decide to try to explore it. So they find that people do live on this island, and it's called Salal, and the people there are dark-skinned, and they go even further. They're not just dark-skinned, but all the animals on this island have black fur. It turns out that these people's teeth is even black, and they also have an aversion to anything white. So like skinned people, but also objects that are white, like white animals, white paper. And of course, see how this narrative is going, there's kind of this, can we trust th these people that we just discovered on this island? So eventually, the whole thing ends on a cl cliffhanger, which I won't tell you all about, but involves this giant white shrouded figure. And is sort of one of the, the big cliffhangers in history. Eventually, Jules Verne wrote a sequel to the book called An Antarctic Mystery, which has sometimes been called an early piece of fan fiction. So I did not read that book. But skipping ahead to 2011, there was another book that I did read. It's called Pym by Matt Johnson. So in this book, there is a man named Chris Janes. He's the only African-American who teaches in the literature department at his college, but he ends up losing his job. So James thinks that this is in part because he doesn't want to be on the diversity committee. He doesn't want to teach African-American literature. In fact, what he wants to teach is Edgar Allan Poe, and he's completely obsessed with him. And he has a lot of thoughts about all this whiteness and darkness business towards the end of the book. So James is out of a job, but pretty soon he happens to discover a manuscript by Dirk Peters. And he thinks, what? Dirk Peters was actually a real person? And so pretty soon he's headed off to Antarctica along with his good friend Garth. Garth loves little Debbies and also a painter who's a lot like Thomas Kincaid, both of which sort of end up <laughs> featuring in the plot, improbably enough again. And let's see, who else is in his crew? His cousin, Chris James's cousin, Captain Booker James, Chris's ex-wife, her new husband, and these two guys who run an adventure blog. And so like Poe's book, this is not a perfect book, but whereas Poe goes for adventure, Matt Johnson really goes for humor. So there is so much in this book that is funny. I thought a few of his jokes for me kind of fell flat, but on the other hand, there were so many that were really good that <laughs> I really enjoyed the book. And I really just enjoyed a book that was about another book because I'm a librarian and I love books. So those were the two things that I read this week. So I will pass it to Nancy. Thank you, Catherine. I finished reading a book this week entitled Information Hunters, When Librarians, Soldiers, and Spies Banded Together in World War II Europe. It's a very dense book. It covers the beginning of the, about the 10 years before the war starts, what's going on in the archives, library, and research world in the United States, and covers what's going on capturing information with dual purposes, both trying to capture information and intelligence and counterintelligence and microfilming and traveling and all these various people. It's a very com complicated scenario going on with trying to capture information, trying to save information, to save knowledge in pre-war and war-torn Europe. So what's interesting is the players in some of the major players in here really impact how librarians, archivists, and researchers work today because for example, the ninth Librarian of Congress, Archibald McLeish, who's from Glencoe, Illinois, was the Library of Congress during the time he went over to Europe to spearhead this program. If you've ever used WorldCat, you might want to know that it was founded by Frederick Kilgore, who was working for the OSS in Europe and launched, was the first to really use computers for catalogs. If you've ever used ProQuest, Eugene Power, founded University Microfilms, was also involved in the OSS and first began microfilming information in 1939. And as most pe people using libraries and librarians and archivists use these resources every day to this day. After the war ended, they're still collecting information, they're still collecting intelligence to try and interpose what people's world views. And you also have American libraries competing, in particular, Hubert Hoover himself goes over to collect. It's a, a window into how certain research libraries developed and how and with what resources and what ethics and what groups. There's also questions of who owns what. So they want to destroy Nazi imprints. So Americans, they were going to burn all the books, but kind of realizing, oh, wait, we don't want to burn books. So there's interesting ideological um, questions in this very dense book. It's also very sad because there are archives and book collections that are found and the family is simply um, exterminated. But it basically, it doesn't give opinions and it lays out basically what happens, not just to the people, but the books and information after war which is always an issue in war when archives and library are almost like booty. I highly recommend this book. It took me a while to read it, longer than usual because of the dense facts and my own interest in how it affects our work today in archives and libraries, the development profession, and both how collecting was done. On the same note of World War II, 
every year in France on October 22nd, there's letters read from people that were killed as hostages by the Germans. In addition to many other things, the Nazis have this perverse habit of giving papers to people who are about to be shot, especially hostages in retaliation for German soldiers, and telling them to write a letter to their family. So in particular, one letter by Guy Mouquet is read by school children every year. There's a film that talked about Guy and his group of friends and comrades, a selection of politicians, Jews, communists, and especially Jewish communists were the first selected to be shot by the Germans. And this film is called Calm at Sea. We have it in the library on DVD. It's on Hoopla, and it's also on Canopy. And I, I particularly like this movie because it uses archival resources, including these many letters written by people who were about to be killed. And in particular, the letter by Guy Mouquet, his girlfriend, he wrote a letter to his girlfriend, who's still alive. Every year, she goes to commemoration, and the letters are read. It also called pulled upon the archives, the diaries by Ernest Junger, the German officer who is also a Francophile, perversely, and wrote extensively daily during both World War I and World War II about his observations, and including his observations of these reprisals against hostages during World War II by the Germans against resistance. And Guy Mouquet, the 17-year-old who was shot on October 22nd, 1941, his crime was handing out leaflets in the metro, and there's now a metro station named after him. He's named Ben Fouet, Guy Mouquet in Paris. So that's all I have, and something more cheerful probably with William. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. We'll, we'll see about that. <laughs> with Halloween, two weeks away, I've decided to dip into my collection of seasonally appropriate book and movie material. One of my favorite series to pick up and watch again is the anime Another, which is based on a 2009 manga series of the same name by Yukito Ayatsuki. Now, the story takes place in 1998 with a young boy, Koichi Sakaibara, who finds himself in a very bad way. His mother passed away when he was born, and his father is doing research in India, which results in him having to move from the big city Tokyo, where he grew up, to the small town where his mother grew up to live with his grandparents and aunt. On top of that, he catches a bad case of pneumonia before the series begins and misses the first few days of school. When he arrives, there's one classmate who stands out among the rest, Mei Misaki, for two reasons. One, she has an eye patch. The second is the fact that everyone, from the teacher to every single student, is pretending to ignore the fact that she is there. With no sort of context, Koichi decides to befriend her and get to the bottom of the campaign against May. What he learns is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This series does a fine job of straddling the line between horror and thriller. The mystery of what is going on is very well structured. The story really keeps viewers enthralled as they're trying to figure out the mystery. And it does play fair. Like you can watch it and figure out the kind of logical throughput of everything. However, I must say, because of the nature of the issue, which I'm purposely being vague about, just in case you decide to watch it, means that there's a lot of gruesome and violent death in this series. Just beware, be aware. You can either request a copy of this from our friendly consortium members, or if you're in a rush, it is currently streaming on Crunchyroll and VRV, which are free, well, at least free anime streaming services with ads. The other thing I have been doing is re-listening to one of my favorite seasonal podcasts, which is Halloween Unmasked, which is an eight-part series from the Ringer Podcast Network that celebrates the Halloween film series horror franchise. Beyond the fact that it covers the pound-for-pound best American horror franchise, with apologies to Freddie, Jason, and all the Cenobites, host and film critic Amy Nicholson covers everything from John Carpenter's early years and the events that inspired the Michael Myers character to Jamie Lee Curtis and her legacy in the horror genre as a scream queen to really esoteric topics like interviewing people who have the name Michael Myers and what it's like to live in a world where Michael Myers is most known for Halloween and finding people to actually defend the oft-derided third movie in the series Season of the Witch. You can find the series on Spotify and at the link below. And with that, I will pass it along to Lori. Thanks, William. I skipped completely over Halloween and went directly to Thanksgiving, the semi-forgotten holiday. I read a book called We Gather Together. The subtitle is A Nation at War, A President in Turmoil, and a Historic Campaign to Embrace Gratitude and Grace. It's by Denise Kiernan, who wrote The Last Castle and The Girls of Atomic City. So the book is actually mostly about a woman named Sarah Josepha Hale, who was born shortly after the Revolutionary War. Her father had been seriously wounded in the Revolutionary War. And like many women of that time, she didn't have a formal education. She basically followed along her older brother who went to Dartmouth and then came home and kind of taught her 
what he was learning all along. Anyway, she married a doctor. They had a happy marriage. They had five young children, and then he, he suddenly died, and she had no means of support. So she decided she was going to earn a living for her and her children by poetry and literature. And she actually wrote a poem you may have heard of called Mary Had a Little Lamb. She's really quite, quite an interesting woman, probably like many women of the time that you know have just been forgotten from history. But she moved to Boston, and... She edited, she became the editor of a literary magazine for women and then publisher of Godey's Ladies book, which was the most popular women's magazine of the time, decided he wanted her to edit his magazine, but she didn't want to. So long story short, he, he bought her magazine and then she actually, it was located in Philadelphia, but she, she lived in Boston and was you know, we, we could call it working remotely, but back then it was really a big deal. Anyway, so Sarah Josepha Hale had a lot of sadness in her life. She had some amazing accomplishments, but then she decided she was going to devote her life to having a national day devoted to Thanksgiving with a small T, not a big T Thanksgiving, because at the time there had been each, each state or each territory might choose a different day for Thanksgiving Day. So she lobbied all of those forgettable presidents that led up to Lincoln, you know, like the ones with the sideburns, you know. She lobbied them all, make one day throughout all the United States. And then the Civil War came. And in 1862 or 1863, I believe it was, she wrote to Abraham Lincoln. She didn't give up. She just was very persistent. She did not give up. And she wrote to Abraham Lincoln and I think his secretary, um, Stinson, she wrote to both of them. And Lincoln actually did, this was like shortly after Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Address, he, he issued a proclamation of Thanksgiving. This was a big thing. But still, Thanksgiving itself was not designated by an act of Congress until sometime after like Franklin Roosevelt, because it kept bouncing back and forth from, anyway, Sarah, back to Sarah. She edited Godey's Lady's book until she was 88, and she passed away at age 90, but she still had not seen it become like a national holiday, which was not until, I think, the 1940s. But in the book, after telling the story of Sarah Josepha Hale, Denise Kernan talks about how the idea of setting aside time to give thanks is not necessarily the Pilgrim story, and how the Pilgrim story wasn't even part of what she wanted this holiday to be about, and how it actually has its roots in almost every, every culture and every religion, and especially, you know, Native American culture and practices, the idea of giving thanks for earth, for what, what you, your harvest or whatever, is really very much of a Native American idea. And it's very sad because the way Thanksgiving, the, the whole story of Thanksgiving, which is not historically true, that many Native Americans see Thanksgiving is a day of mourning, big T Thanksgiving, not little T Thanksgiving. And then in the third part of the book, Denise Kernan talks about the whole science of gratitude and how people, you know, scientific studies have found that even trying to think positively and trying to think of, of things to be grateful for, writing a note, not even giving it to anyone, how it can have really positive effects on your, your well-being. So it's quite an interesting book. It comes out uh, November 10th. I enjoyed it and I recommend it. And that's all I have to talk about today. So I'm going to pass it back to Sarah to um, take us out. Thanks, Laurie. That sounds great. That's it for today, folks. As always, please remember that we are all here for you. We are available for comments, questions, or concerns that you may have, and you can reach us online through Facebook at facebook.com slash hplibrary, through our Twitter, which is at hplibrary, or via email at hppla at hplibrary.org. Because the library's hours and services can change suddenly due to COVID, it is best to contact us via email or via chat on our website before coming to the library. Our music today was Carefree by Kevin McLeod, and you can find more information about this and the titles we mentioned in our show notes below. Okay, everybody, this is us signing off. Until next time, stay safe.